David Bergman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was officially a smattering of applause. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, thanks you guys for coming. Everybody's feet hurt by now. You've been walking around the show. Yep, all right, have a seat, you guys. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, I was just telling these guys, I'm on tour right now with a country artist, Luke Combs, and right before the band takes the stage, they all get together and take a shot of Jack. So I'm suggesting that we all do that now, but we're not gonna do it. But um, for future reference, it's a good way to get the show started. So basically, for a number of years, uh, for three years, I did a show, a weekly web show called Two Minute Tips with David Bergman. And it was exactly that, little two minute photo tips. And uh, how many people watch that? Did anybody see that? Hey, good, we got some two minute tips people here. Um, so it was cool, I had the nice, uh, the nice little uh, graphic, the big two minute tips graphic. And I did that show for three years. And then just recently, I've started doing a new weekly show called Ask David Bergman. So what I do is I take questions from people. So if you go to askdavidbergman.com, actually, you can ask your own photo questions on there. But what happened was this two-minute tips, there were so many great little tips that people still come up to me about that they got something out of it. Sometimes it's a more advanced photo technique and sometimes just a little silly thing that they didn't think of. And it's, I found it to be really useful. So what I'm gonna do, this is a 45 minute block and I've already used about three minutes. So what I'm gonna do is kind of a rapid fire, if I can, of 20 two minute tips. And I'm hoping I can get through all 20 of them in about 40 minutes. So it's different than the video series because that was scripted and I, you know, we could time it, we could rehearse it multiple times and I could get it in two minutes. This one, I'm not sure how it's gonna work. Some might go a little long, some might go a little short, but hopefully everybody will get at least one good new tip out of it. So we're gonna start with something really simple, card management. So what am I talking about? The little cards that go in your camera, right? You may have a whole bunch of them and what happens? They're hard to organize sometimes and you're not sure which is which. So I use these little card wallets. I hope if you have more than one card, and you should have more than one card, that you have one of these card wallets. This is a little think tank one, and you can open this sucker up and it holds cards. They make different arrangements. Some of them take SD, some of them take CF, but I put my cards in here, why? Well, the first obvious reason is that when it's folded up, it protects it from dust and dirt and all those kinds of things. So that's really nice, but Here's a little tip. If you're shooting an assignment and you have multiple cards, let's say you're shooting a big long event and you are constantly changing cards throughout the show, right? These cameras shoot 16, 20 frames a second. You might have to change cards. So what happens? You take the card out of your camera, you look at your card wallet and you go, I don't know which ones were I shot on and which ones I didn't and it's a nightmare. So here's a little tip, right? When I take my card out of the camera, what I do, once I've shot pictures on it, I flip it over and then I put it in the card wallet with the backside facing out. So I know as soon as I look at this, if the backside is showing, don't touch it. There's images on there. Until I format that card and reuse it again or I've backed it up and format it, then I flip it back over again. But until that point, I know if it's upside down, that's where it goes. Also, the most valuable thing in your camera bag is what? It's these cards, right? Because the images are the most important thing. They can't be reshot in many cases. Sure, the, the camera gear is expensive, I get it. You don't wanna lose it, but if something were to happen, it could be replaced. These cannot be replaced. So at the end of the night, these cards go in the card wallet and goes in my pocket. This doesn't stay in the camera, the card doesn't stay in the camera, always gets pulled in my pocket, stays with me until I've backed everything up. All right, number one, we're getting in the groove here. Two bodies are better than one. And if you come to my workshop, which some of you have been to my live workshop, you know that I shoot all night long when I shoot a concert with two camera bodies, each with separate lenses on it. Why do I do that? Well, really the main reason is you can have two separate lenses, one wide and one tight. When I shoot concerts, I'm sh I always make sure to shoot a nice wide shot of the venue. I wanna give it a sense of place. I want you to know where we are and what, we're, what I'm seeing at the venue, not just the tight stuff. So. For example, I spent 10 years on the road with Bon Jovi, and this is on stage somewhere in South America, probably. Actually, this, I think this is in Brazil. And I'm doing a wide shot from the stage, but then what happens? Somebody throws a Brazilian flag on the stage, and I wanna make that picture really quickly. Well, what happens? If I only have one body and multiple lenses, I have to try to, in the dark, switch lenses, take it off, put the other one down somewhere, 
what's going to happen? I'm going to drop it. It's going to take too much time. I'm going to miss the picture, right? So if by having two separate bodies, I can shoot the nice wide shot, and then very quickly I can switch over to the tight shot. And any time I want, I can make wide, I can make tight, simply by switching. I'm also a bit, um, I'm a creature of habit, like many photographers are, and I always keep the long lens on my right side and the short lens, the wide lens on my left side. That's just a little habit I have so that I know when I reach down to pick one up, I know exactly which one I'm going to get. If I want to make a wide shot, I'm immediately going to my left hand. So just a little tip there to, to uh, be consistent. All right, we're moving now. Light stands. So here's the thing. When you're using big light stands in the studio, there's a couple little things to be concerned about. So um, the main thing is safety, right? You really want to be safe with these big C stands, especially when you're using those. So what you want to do, you always want to have one of the legs of the tripod under the light, right? So the, so the weight is being taken by that light. If you're using a C stand, the top leg is called the big leg. So that one is the most sturdy. That's the one you want directly under the light. So that light has less chance of falling forward. If you have the legs spread out and the light forward, it's going to tip over a lot easier. A couple other things. If you're using a boom arm and you have that, um, that sort of that knuckle thing where you screw it tight, a little tip with that, if you hold that thing when you are facing with the light going out from you, you stand behind it, you want that knuckle, the part that you tighten, you want that to be on your right side, right? So the light is there, the light's facing that way, the stand goes out like this. The thing is here, that part that I tighten needs to be on my right. Why? When you tighten it that direction, if that light starts, if it's really heavy, which it probably is, if that light starts to push down, that knuckle's actually going to tighten. If you did it the other way and it started to push down, it would loosen and the whole thing's going to fall over. So you always want that little knuckle on the right side. Lastly, with light stands, as far as safety, is it, when you use a boom arm like that, that other end is open, right? That's a safety hazard. Somebody's going to walk in. Remember when your mother used to say, you're going to poke your eye out, right? Somebody's going to do that on the end of this light stand. So what you want to do is you want to cover that thing either with a water bottle, tape it up. You could put a tennis ball on the end. Whatever you have with you, even if it's just, you know, a loaf of French bread or something. Whatever you've got on the end of that thing, just to soften that point. So nobody pokes their eye out. My mother will be happy I got that one in there. All right, remote cameras. This is something that I used to do a lot in sports photography. I worked for Sports Illustrated for many years, and we set up remote cameras at all kinds of places. Why is this? Why do we do it? Well, the real reason is, there's two reasons. First one, you can be in two places at once. So I could have a remote camera set up in two different places and the picture that I'm shooting, and I could shoot all of them at once. But I can also put cameras in places where you physically can't stand, right? I'm fortunate that I can be on stage with most of these artists, but I don't want to stand there all night long right in the middle of the show, right? So when John Bon Jovi comes right up to that drum kit, if I was standing right there, it's going to be obnoxious. So I don't want to do that. So what I can do is put a camera on the stage. This is actually for the Luke Combs show. There's actually plenty of space there on that drum riser. So I use, that's the platypod, the floor plate. There, I think they're just down the row here with a ball head on it. And I can put that camera right there. With Jovi, I actually used to bury it into the drum kit. And what I use is this exact setup here. So this is a Manfrotto um, super clamp with a magic arm. And I can put the camera on the end here and basically just clamp this thing to just about anything I want, tighten it down, and then all you got to do is tighten this knuckle, and that thing will stay, right? And you can place this anywhere you want. And then, if this is on, put a pocket wizard on the end of it to transmit, and I can take pictures remotely from wherever I am in the crowd. So that allows me so much more flexibility to get pictures in different places. Um, this is what it looks like. Sometimes I will put one in the lighting truss. So what happens is in the, in the morning when, when the crew is setting up the stage, I will clamp that thing into the lighting truss, and then they raise it up. And I go, bye, camera. I hope you don't fall. Um, of course, I use safety cables so that it doesn't fall. But uh, I'm not going to see that camera again until the end of the night. But when I put a camera up overhead, I can make pictures like that, right? Nobody else can make that picture. I have the only, I'm the only one that has that kind of access. So using remote cameras really allows me to get those kind of unique pictures that nobody else can get. All right, I'm jumping all over the place, but we're getting here. We're number five. 
I think I'm in good timing here. So portable printer power, right? Canon makes these little printers called selfies, right? I am a big fan of making prints. Why? It's a really nice thing to give prints to your subjects, right? We ask them to do a lot of things. We have to, they have to stand around while we're setting up lights, right? Sometimes they're un it's uncomfortable maybe making pictures of them. And, and we ask our subjects a lot of things from our subjects. So what can you do? Well, of course, you can email them a photo, you know, but email, it's good. But you swipe through photos. I don't think they have as much power. When you make, let's say you take the Pro 1000 and you make a nice 11 by 14 on matte paper, you sign it, you know, you, maybe you frame it and you give it to them. There's a power to a print that just iPhone photos just don't have, right? So what I like to do, if I have that kind of time and I can make an 11 by 14 and give that to them maybe the next day or the next week, I can't tell you how many times, as a good example, I, would, I was shooting a band and their publicist, just a very famous publicist, was there. And I sent him after the fact, I mailed him a photograph. Now this guy works with every big name in the world. In my mind, it's like, what's the big deal? It's a photograph of one of his artists. I think it was a nice picture, but nevertheless, a nice matte print, signed and dated. I didn't hear anything from him. It's fine. You can't do it with the hope of getting something immediately back. You just do it because it's good karma. And maybe a year later, I ran into the guy, and he came up to me, David Bergman, you're my favorite photographer. I still have that picture hanging on my wall. I look at it every single day. So I really love to do that. Now, Sometimes I take it one step further, and they, like I said, Canon has these little selfie printers, these little tiny things. They actually, you can put a battery in it so you can bring it on site and not even have to worry about plugging it in. And what you could do is you can just go ahead and make a print while you're there. You can pull the little card out of the uh, camera, put it right in. Sometimes you can go wirelessly. There's different ways to get the picture. But you can make these nice little postcard size prints, four by six, five by seven, and give it to your subject right there. It really has a huge impact. I promise you, they will never forget the photo shoot with you if you give them a little print either on site or after the fact. Really cool thing to do. All right, number six, epic portrait angle. You want to make a really epic portrait, especially somebody like an athlete or a musician or something like that. How do you do it? Well, this works not only with athletes, but also with kids, right? So you're photographing your kids. You want to make them look amazing, powerful, larger than life. Well, what do most people do? You stand there, you look down, you take a picture. It looks like that, right? Poor little kid looks puny. I mean, she's not really that tall, but, you know, she looks even punier than she is. All you got to do, get down on your knees, get to their eye level. When you shoot somebody at their own eye level, now all of a sudden they're equals, right? They're equal size to you. This works whether you're using a wide angle or a long lens. It still works. If you get down low, when I shot sports on the sidelines, my knees and my back are still paying for it. But every game I was kneeling down on the sidelines and looking up at the athletes. So when you get really, really low, you can make them look larger than life. So it's really kind of a fun thing to play with to get as low as you can. And think about that. Don't just be lazy and stand there and look down, but really get down low. And you can make an amazing like portrait of a little kid. This is a Nerf, you know, a Nerf basketball that's probably this high. But if you lay down on the ground and look up and add a little strobe in there, you can really make a nice epic portrait. All right, long lenses. What am I talking about? Things like this, right? Man, this new 400 is really light. By the way, I picked it up like, oh, oh hey. Um, this is a 400 millimeter 2.8 lens, right? Really nice. Not a lot of people shoot with these things, but it's a couple things. If you ever get the opportunity, you should rent one, try it out. It's really insanely cool to shoot through. Um, but there's a couple tips when you use a lens like this. They're not cheap, so you really want to be careful with it. Um, the first thing is when you pick up this lens, you really want to pick it up by the tripod collar, right? You really don't want to pick it up any other place. Usually you're attached to a monopod, right? Which I'm going to pull out here. Very typical monopod. Let's screw that on. This is the exciting part of the show here. But so if you have this thing down on the ground, which usually you put it down like that, right? When you pick it up, pick it up by this collar. Because if you pick it up by the monopod, you're putting all the stress on that little screw right there. And the weight of this thing, granted, this lens is a lot lighter than they used to be. When I was shooting sports, they were about a few pounds heavier than this. But, um, but still, you're putting a lot of stress on that one little connection point. So you always want to pick this thing up by 
the tripod collar. Also, do me a favor, if you ever shoot with a lens like this, please, you, what you do is you carry it over your shoulder and that is absolutely the right way to do it, but please, I see this and it drives me crazy. People hold it like this. Oh my God, this makes me so crazy nervous because look, there's a giant piece of glass right there that you really don't want to scratch. And if you're walking around like this in public, anything could happen to that. I mean, it could, a drop of water or somebody in the stands could throw a piece of popcorn or a nut or something. And the last thing you want to do is scratch that. All you got to do is hold that thing face down and protect that giant piece of glass that's on the front of that camera. Um, the other thing is I don't have a shorter lens with me, but when, uh, if you're using like a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400 or something like that, what you want to do, a really good way to carry it, a lot of times that lens, when you have the strap on your side, it kind of sticks out like this and you walk around and it, it does this, right? <laughs> the whole time when you're walking around, you really don't want that because you're going to break the lens, you're going to break a person, you really don't want to do that. So all you have to do is that whole camera, instead of having it so the lens points out, all you gotta do is flip it over and put the strap on that way, and that lens, you'll see, it tucks right up against your body, and it's a lot more protected, and you're not gonna hit anybody, and you're not gonna break that lens. So when you're using long lenses, be careful. <laughs> you don't wanna break those things. Uh, monopod, hey, well, I've got the monopod. A lot of people actually don't use a monopod correctly. There's a few things. Uh, first of all, if you don't know what a monopod is, it's monopod, one leg of a tripod, right? Just one. Why would you use it? Well, uh, usually use it with long lenses. Couple reasons. First of all, it's going to be a lot more stable, right? You can really stabilize that shoot. And when you're using a really long lens, um, you want to have it as stable as possible because you've got to shoot faster shutter speeds. You're, since you're shooting so far away, you know how like when you, um, if you tap a wide angle lens, like you really won't see any movement, but a long lens, like a telescope, if you tap it, it's going to move around like crazy. So this will really help you to stabilize that shot. Also, those lenses are heavy, right? So the monopod definitely helps as far as weight. Um, so definitely a good thing to use. However, when shouldn't you use a monopod? I, this is another thing that drives me crazy. I got some pet peeves here tonight. But one thing that drives me nuts is when I see photographers using, let's say, a 24 to 105 or something on a monopod, OK? There's really no reason to do that. Somebody must have taught you, not you, but whoever does that, somebody must have taught them somewhere that you need a monopod to freeze action, right? That that's just, you need it to freeze action. Well, that's not really the case, right? Like I said, you use it to enhance the stability, but for, if you're shooting sports action, even on a wide angle lens, if you're shooting a fast shutter speed, you can handhold that thing and you can move it around no problem. You're not gonna see any motion when you're shooting 500 of a second, 1,000 of a second. You do not need a monopod. Don't be that person with the monopod on a short lens. The only time I think you can get away with that is if you were using the monopod to do a high, like a, like a Hail Mary picture, right? If you had a remote and you were getting it over somebody's head, that's the time I could see you do that. By the way, if you didn't know, these things, most of these have like four sections so you can open them the way up, right? And they collapse down really small. So that, <laughs> there you go. Um, so... These things are just really great. Just use them correctly. Don't be that person on the sidelines with a wide angle lens on a monopod, please, please, please. All right, this is kind of a silly one, but it, another thing that drives me crazy. I should have called this things that drive David Bergman crazy, top 20 things. But um, this is one of those things where if you are um, you know, on vacation and you've got your family, your friend, and you have the Eiffel Tower, right? And you want to take a picture of them in front of the Eiffel Tower. What do most people do? They say, Go stand next to the Eiffel Tower, and I'll back up and make the picture, right? What does that look like? It looks like this, right? The person is teeny tiny, teeny tiny, all the way up against the Eiffel Tower, right? And you can't see them at all. Well, if you think about it, all you really have to do is bring that person close, because you want to show the person. Of course, you want to show the Eiffel Tower, but you also want to see the person's face, right? So if you bring them up close, you can make a picture of them and still have the thing in the background. You can still see the Eiffel Tower. If they block a little bit of it, it's not really that big a deal, right? But it's okay to cover some of it. But you want to see the face and you want to see the Eiffel Tower a mile in the background. That's totally okay. Once you bring them up close, it also gives you some new options, right? You can add a little fill flash, right? And that will allow you to darken the sky. You can darken the background. So because they're not a mile away from you, 
you now have that option to add in a little bit of flash. You can also back up a little bit, use a longer lens, and just kind of do something a little more, um, a little more creative like that, where you sort of see parts of the image. But you don't have to send the person eight miles away, and then they're going to be teeny tiny, itty -tiny, tiny little people in front of the Eiffel Tower. Stop doing that, all right? Carry on conundrum. How many people travel with photo gear, right? It's a pain in the ass, right? A pain in the, the butt, right? So we can say ass now, right? That's OK. They say it on network TV. All right, it's a pain in the ass. So, um, so I'm sure Seth says much worse than that on his show. But anyway, um, carry on, right? Carry on is the bane of all of our existence. How to get this gear on the plane. You obviously don't want to check most of it. Now, I do say anything that you can check that's less fragile, like battery chargers and monopods and remote gear, you know, the metal gear, that stuff. Get it out of your carry-on and put it in your checked bag, right? But this stuff, you want to bring as much of this stuff as possible onto the plane. So now, I'm not telling you to break any airline rules, please. If this goes out on the internet, do not break any airline rules, right? But I carry a bag on the plane that might be a little too heavy, right? Technically, it might be a little too heavy. But there's a few things that I do. First of all, it helps to have good status with the airline. So if you fly the same airline a lot, they're a little nicer to you about that stuff. If you're the last person on the plane in row 87, you know, middle, then you might not have, uh, you might have a hard time. But if you get on the plane, when you get into that overhead space, you really want to put it in the overhead and just pretend like it weighs nothing. It's going to be like, doop a doop a doo no problem. Because if you go, oh, God, Jesus, if you do that, they're going to they're gonna stop you and you're going to have a problem. So we definitely want to be careful with that. If they won't let you take the bag on, let's say you have to gate check it. Well, first of all, I do know photographers have done this. I've never stooped to this myself. But technically, if it's on your person, you can carry it on the plane. So I've seen photographers take everything out of their bags, put shoulder straps on, even wearing those like photo vests, stuffing all the pockets, and walking on the plane like that with everything, right? Um, I've never stooped to that myself, but I do know people. And then the bag is empty, and you can check the bag, right? Um, however, what I've done, if I have to gate check the bag, I will do it. These, I use the think tank rollers mostly, and they're pretty good with gate check, not the not the like check where it goes to baggage claim, but just the gate check. They take, it at the, they take it right at the plane. They give it back to you at the plane. This is what I do. This isn't going to leave here, right? But I have a little trick that what I do. When I, when I go to the end of the jetway, I wait for the person who's actually going to take the bag. And I tell them, I say, look, I don't want to say there's cam there are cameras in here. Because first of all, they'll either think, ah, everybody's got cameras. That's no big deal. Or if I say, oh, there's a lot of really expensive, fragile cameras in here, then maybe you won't see the bag again, right? So I don't like to stress that I have that. So what I do, my key phrase here is I tell the person there, I say, look, I need to gate check this. It's really heavy. It's kind of fragile. There's a big piece of glass in there. And they go, oh. And I go, oh, you know, it's padded, but it's really heavy. You can just be careful with it. And they go, oh, OK. We'll put it on last, and we'll try to, I don't know if they're really going to do it, but it makes me feel a little better. Here's the thing. I'm not lying. There are lots of pieces of glass in there, right? If they think it's a vase or something like that, I don't care. I don't tell them otherwise. But just to, just to give, make them take it a little bit more seriously, I travel a lot with my photo gear. I don't have to gate check very often, but if you have to, I'm sure now as everybody starts to do that because they watch this, uh, they watch this video, I'm gonna, they're going to put a stop to that. But it's a good little trick to uh, work on. All right, we're rolling. We're about halfway through. Number 11, button remapping. A lot of people don't know or don't realize that just about, I mean, I did a talk yesterday on the Canon 1DX Mark II and Mark III, and just about every button on that thing is reprogrammable. It's customizable. You can make the buttons do almost anything you want. So the more you shoot and the more you get comfortable with your own gear, you might find ways to use those buttons a little bit differently. I'll give you a couple of examples. So the, with the Canon system, the way you remap them is in, there's a custom controls menu. This is not on every camera, but on many of the, especially the higher end cameras. There's a custom controls menu. And in that menu, you can look at every single button and you can reprogram them. The whole idea is you want to make your life easier because you don't want to have to hunt for buttons while you're shooting. Again, in my workshops, I talk a lot about not paying attention to the camera. You want to pay attention to what's happening in front of the camera. That's how you make great pictures, is by paying attention and forgetting about the camera. The camera should just be second nature. So if there's a button you can move or change, 
do it. You know, it'll really help you out. I'll give you an example. I use the back button focus. Anybody use back button focus? Good. I like to see it. Can you shoot any other way? You can't shoot any other way, right? Once you start using back button focus. But here's the thing. And I'm a big Canon fan, obviously, but sometimes that AF on button, it just, it's a little too far over for my thumb, right? When I'm in a hurry and I smash down on the button, sometimes I hit the wrong button. The star button is right next to the AF on button. Guess what? I've programmed that star button to be the same as AF on. So I can hit either button. I don't care which button I mash down on. I'm still going to have the same functionality. Now, of course, again, in my talk yesterday, the 1DX Mark III, that AF on button has some additional functionality. It has an optical sensor on it, so you can move your focus points on the button itself, which is awesome. But if you don't want to use that functionality, you can program both buttons to the same thing. One of them has the optical sensor. One of them doesn't. So then it gives you options. So whatever's going to work for you. You can, for example, by default, the top dial, I can never remember the names of the dials, but the top dial is shutter speed and the back dial is aperture, right? You can switch those if you want. If you rather have aperture on your, on your forefinger and shutter speed on your thumb, you can do that. You can absolutely switch it. Something like the magnification, right? Sometimes after I shoot, a, especially a portrait, I want to zoom in. I want to look at it at 100%, make sure it's, the eyes are tack sharp, which, of course, with eye detection now, it's totally going to be sharp. But if I just want to make sure and double check, that magnification button is on the left side on most cameras. So you have to actually, when you hold the camera down, you have to take your hand off of the lens and push that magnification button. What you can do is you can remap that magnification to the set button in the middle of the back dial. So your thumb is already very close to that. All you got to do is put it down, hit that set button. You don't have to move your left hand out of the way. It's right there. You can magnify. So those are just three little examples. But my point is that you can remap any one of those buttons to whatever works for your style. All right, histograms. Who knows what a histogram is? All right, a good, good crowd. Well, everybody knows, of course, a histogram is a diagram consisting of rectangles whose area is proportional to the frequency of a variable and whose width is equal to the class interval. Right? Makes perfect sense. You got it? That is literally what the histogram is. But for those of you who don't really know how that applies to photography, that little mountain range that's on the back of your camera after you take the picture, it's a simple sort of graph of the brightness of the pixels in your image from the blackest black to the whitest white, right? It's from 100% black to 100% white. And it's a good way to really give you a visual description. Forget color. This has nothing to do with color. Imagine the image was in black and white, and just look at how bright or dark every pixel is. And it's a good overview of how you would do it. Now, really, how would you use this? So for example, uh, cameras, all cameras have a dynamic range. Our eyes have an amazing dynamic range that really, at this point, can't be replicated by cameras. Every generation of camera gets better with capturing the brightest brights and the darkest darks. But sometimes you have to figure out where that exposure is in the middle. If you're shooting a, just a simple picture like this, you can choose you want to expose for the sky, right? And then you're, the building's going to be a little too dark. Or you can expose for the building, and then the sky might be blown out. But if you can get it somewhere in the middle, you're going to see that mountain range is all contained in your histogram, as long as you don't have anything that's way pushed to the right or way pushed to the left. If it starts to look like this, then you're going to have, that's a really dark image, because most of your data is way down at the bottom. Whereas if you move it, if you expose the other way, that's like that picture. It's underexposed, right? But then if you move your exposure the other direction and it's way overexposed, that mountain range is going to be all the way on the right. So why would you do this, right? Well. Maybe if you're outside in bright sunlight, you can't really see the screen that well, you can still judge your exposure based on that histogram. You're kind of reading. It's like piloting by the numbers, right? You're not really watching, looking at the image, but you're really just looking at the data. And it's a true-to-life example. Now, of course, you have to use your own creativity. You might want the picture darker. You might want the picture lighter. But at the end of the day, that histogram will help you to get exactly where you need. All right, building the background. This is, I'm, I love that I'm like all over the map here, right? So this is about portraits, right? I, do a, I used to do more of it, but I will occasionally do a lot of portraiture. I had the unfortunate time of spending four years in a row shooting a swimsuit calendar in Belize. I know, don't feel bad for me. Somebody had to do it. But I did it for years. What I did was I used speed lights. 
And I used a lot of speed lights. I'd have 8, 10, 12 speed lights in a shoot. How do you manage that, right? If you just put up a whole bunch of speed lights and fire, you have no idea what's going on. So I am meticulous about my portrait photography where I want to add one light at a time and build it up. So really, I start with the background, right? The front light, the subject light, you can kind of add in at the end. But all of the other stuff that's going to be happening in the scene, I want to do first. So let's go through a typical example of that horribly unfortunate swimsuit calendar. And this is, these are indoors, right? This was in a bar. I start with a black exposure. I want to have my ISO low. And by the way, it's ISO. It's not ISO. You can fight me on it if you want, but I promise you it's ISO. Um, <laughs> so you start with a black frame. You want low ISO. You want to shoot at your flashing speed, maybe a mid-range aperture. So you've killed your ambient, right? There's no ambient light in this picture. And then in this case, we're in a bar. There's a jukebox. So I put one light on the ground aimed at that jukebox. Now, I spend a good amount of time getting that light, the zoom right, the positioning right, everything exactly where I want. So that jukebox looks perfect, OK? Right? That's how I want it. Then, and by the way, I'm shooting, I'm a manual strobe guy, so I have all these on manual. I don't want it to readjust every frame. I want, I'm going to lock that thing in. I can control it from the camera, which is awesome. I can change all my settings. So I'm just sitting down on my Apple box you know, having people move around the strobes for me. But once I get it exactly where I want, I turn that off, right? And then what I do, I bring in somebody just to stand in. That's not a Belizean swimsuit model, unfortunately. But bring somebody in. Now I set up my second light. This is a hair light. So we have it clamped up overhead, and I can fire that down. Again, I work on the positioning. I work on the power until it looks exactly where I want. But the key is that first light I've turned off, right? I'm working on them separately. Then once I get this light exactly where I want, I turn the first light back on. Now I've got the two lights going, OK? Very meticulous. Make sure they're not overlapping with each other in a way that looks weird. If they do, i got to start over and figure out what's happening, right? In this case, the two lights look good. All right, turn those both off. Now, light number three. I've got these um, sort of these beer cases uh, on the side that I want to light up. So I put another light just on that, right? Get my exposure, get my angle. Everything looks good. Guess what I do next? All three lights on, OK? Got the jukebox light, got the hair light, got that left side light. They all look good together, OK? Turn them all off. Light number four, completely separate. I've got a gelled light underneath the jukebox shooting forward. I can see how that looks by itself. Turn all four lights back on, right? And I can see, you can see what I'm doing here, right? Then we got one more light I put behind the wall, right? So we have that one going. But turn them all on, make sure they work. Everything looks good together. Then I can start to add in my subject light, right? This is uh, our stand-in, right? So uh, it's better than if I was doing it, believe me. But, uh, and so then I, the subject light was relatively easy, just a nice big soft box. But again, I want to make sure it doesn't mess up everything else that I did. Once I've got all that on, then we add in, we wet the floor down. We had a smoke machine. We added that in. And then, by the way, the model the whole time is in makeup and hair, and she's doing her thing. I'll go over and talk, make sure she's good. Then we're all set. Everything's manual. I can set, and now all I have to do is shoot. I can bring the model in and make the picture. And then I can just shoot all day long. This actually wound up being the cover that year. So this picture's got, I don't know, six, seven lights in it. But by going one at a time and meticulously breaking it down, very slowly, confidently, I was able to build up that photograph. All right? So while I was down in Belize, what happens? Well, there's a lot of sand. There's a lot of dust and dirt. I mean, pretty much everywhere we shoot, there's dust. You do, not, you do not want to get dust on your sensor. We've all dealt with it, right? Those horrible dust spots. That's the best case scenario. You just have a dust spot that you have to clone out. Uh, the worst case scenario is you could actually scratch your sensor. The sensor, unfortunately, is one of the most, uh, it, I think it is the most expensive part of the camera. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure, right? Is the sensor the most expensive part of the whole camera? The answer is it depends. All right, I love that confidence there. But um, it's expensive, right? You do not want to scratch the sensor. By the way, I do not clean my own sensors. I, I know there are tools to do it. And if you want to take that chance, knock yourself out. I will send it to CPS and let them do it, because I'm not going to touch that thing. But a couple of things you can do to try to avoid. Well, first of all, if you know you're going to be in a dusty environment, if you're going to be on the beach, something like that, put the lens on the camera before you go out and do not take it off. Right? The most chance of things getting in there is when you're changing lenses. So if you can avoid changing lenses, you're going to be much better off. Another thing you do is when you, if you are changing, where are my little caps here? 
if you are changing lenses, right, and you have to change lenses quickly, as quickly as you can, what you do is you take that back cap and that back, uh, the body cap and the back cap from the lens. When you put these in your bag, you don't just throw them in your bag because if they collect dust and then you put this back on your camera, the dust is going to go right in there. So what do you do? You take these two, they fit perfectly together like that. And now this you can throw in your bag or on the floor and not care about. Wow, that was good. Um, and you don't have to worry about anything getting in there. Do you see that? Standing up, look at that. Do I get lottery credit for that? Um, so uh, by doing that, throwing it in your bag that way, you really are going to minimize that chance of doing that. If you do want to clean it yourself, uh, you could use a rocket blower. Do not blow on it. Please do not blow on your sensor. I know people who've done that. Where is he? Somebody, there he is. Do not do that, please. Uh, you're just going to blow you know, pieces of moisture on it. You don't want to do that. So use a rocket blower or do what I do. Send it to CPS. I think Platinum, they turn it around in a day. So be a Platinum member. You'll get it back quick. So steadiness. I talked a little bit before about using the monopod to really shoot steady. If you're shooting a scene where you have to shoot at a slow shutter speed, right? It's really dark. Each night, I told you at the beginning of a show, not at the beginning of the show, but sometime during a concert, I will go up high and make a picture. A lot of times, I have to shoot that at really slow shutter speeds. But here's the thing. The old rule of shutter speed and steadiness to be able to handhold a lens, the old rule, we used to say that you want the shutter speed to be the number of the denominator of the shutter speed to be higher than your focal length. What does that mean? All right. So if you're shooting a 50 millimeter lens, you want to be shooting at at least a 60th of a second or higher. That's, as a general rule, the best way that when you're hand holding, that you can hand hold that. If you're shooting a 400 millimeter lens like this one, you want to be shooting at at least 400th, 500th of a second or faster. Again, like I mentioned before, the longer the lens, the more chance of movement. Because if you just tap the end of that lens, it's going to move around like crazy. Whereas if you're shooting a 14 millimeter lens, it can wiggle a little bit, even at a 30th of a second, and you're not going to have too much trouble. So I argue in today's modern digital cameras, I think you want to double that number because the sensors are so much more high res now than the film days that if you're shooting a 50 millimeter lens, I'd say go at least 100, 125. If you're shooting a 400 millimeter, 600 millimeter, if you can go to 1500, 2000, you're going to be much safer. Now, if you've got really steady hands, you can get away with a little bit more. Um, of course, you can bump the ISO up, which now, yes, it's ISO. You can bump the ISO up. With these cameras, we've got really high ISOs so that you can shoot faster shutter speeds. But if you really have to shoot slower shutter speeds, there are a couple other things you can do. You really, there are physical things you can do to try to stabilize that lens as much as possible. Um, one thing that, again, drives me crazy, people who shoot with their hand over the lens like this, take your hand and put it under the lens, right? You really want it to be under the lens and not over. The reason is when you're under like this, you can really stabilize that lens a little bit more. This doesn't really give you any stabilization. When you're like this, it really does. You keep your elbows in tight together, put your legs apart a little bit, and you can, this is really rock solid, right? Um, if, you if you're next to a wall, you can lean up against a wall to help a little bit, that'll give you slower shutter speeds also. I mean, even if you really have to shoot like one second exposures, you could be like a biathlete. You know these guys who are in the Olympics, they ski and then they shoot, right? I never understood why that was a sport. But the thing about that is, when they, they ski and their, their heart rate is going up, and then as soon as they stop, they have to aim and shoot. What they do is they can slow their breaths, right? So even if you really have to do it, take a deep breath. You want to, like, take the picture after you exhale, you know? Like, kind of stop breathing almost. Don't stop breathing, but you know what I mean. Um, little things like that that you can do to really stabilize yourself. Also, if you have a camera where you can look through the viewfinder, that extra point of contact, that viewfinder up against your face, will also help to stabilize the camera. Um, if you're shooting video and you, and you don't have a monopod or a tripod or something like that, you can even use the strap, right, the camera strap, and hold the camera out tight as hard as you can against yourself. And that way, you really can move a lot, uh, you can move a lot smoother than if you were just to hold it out like this with the strap loose, right? Um, if nothing else works, if you really have to shoot really long shutter speeds, shoot bursts. Shoot, look, it's digital. You shoot 100 frames, and 99 of them are, have motion in them, and one of them's sharp. You delete the other nine, and you look like a genius, right? Nobody will ever know. 
So just shoot bursts. I do that when I'm shooting 30th of a second up at the top of an arena. I still shoot at least 10, 20, 30 frames every time because that's just going to give me that option. I can pick the one frame that's tack sharp. Nobody's ever going to see the rest of them. So that's the last resort. All right, we're on the home stretch here. Chimping, <laughs> another thing that bugs me. Um, I'm a big proponent of no chimping. Who here looks at every picture after they shoot it? Nobody's going to admit it. A couple of people. Uh, Some are like, eh, eh, yeah. Um, this is what you look like when you look at every picture after you shoot it, right? You look like that. I'm not going to make any comments, but it, it looks bad, right? So here's the thing. There's actually a number of reasons. I'm kind of joking about you looking like an idiot, but it does look a little silly. But that word chimping, I, I'm pretty sure it comes from back in the 90s, uh, back in my day in the 90s, way back then. We, we had, um, but digital cameras had just come into play. And a lot of us were shooting basketball. I was at the newspaper at the time. I worked at the Miami Herald. And we'd be shooting basketball. And we all sit under the baseline, you know, along the baseline, under the, under the net. And what you do is you switch lenses between shooting the, the close basket and the far basket. So you shoot uh, up here. There's a big slam dunk. You put that camera down. You pick up the long lens. And then you shoot the other end. So what happened was now all of a sudden we started getting these digital cameras. And we could see the picture. How cool, we could never see the picture before. So what do you do? You shoot the slam dunk and then you wanna see the picture. So you look and, you, and all of a sudden now the play is going on and all of a sudden we're looking at the picture and we're going hoo, 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 and we're looking at the picture, right? And then it's like, oh, look at his picture. What did you get over there? And what did you get over there? And we're like picking berries out of each other's hair, right? So uh, it really looked funny when we watched on TV, we looked like sort of a bunch of, of um, orangutans, but, uh, but besides the fact that it kind of looks goofy, the real reason not to do it is that you are missing what's happening, right? When you are looking at your camera, you're missing what's happening in front of you. And it kind of makes you lazy in a way. I remember, again, back in the sports days, when we were shooting, I was just talking with Damien about this. When you were shooting film, you really weren't sure if you had the picture, especially in the manual focus days, right? There'd be a big play, and you'd shoot it. And I don't know about you guys, but most creatives are self-conscious, and we think, I, I miss the picture. I'm the worst photographer in the world. They're never going to hire me again. I'm fired. This is horrible. I know I didn't get it. Well, you didn't know because it was on film. You didn't know till the next day when the magazine would call you and say, no, you actually missed it. But anyway, um, you just didn't know. So because of that, you had to work that much harder, right? I'm having a horrible shoot. I don't have any pictures. I got to keep killing it to make better pictures. Well, now with digital, it's like you can look at it right away. Oh, I made it, you know, and then like mic drop and I'm done. Don't be, let that happen, right? You will have the rest of your life to look at those pictures. Do not use the time at the event or whatever it is you're shooting to look at the pictures. It doesn't matter. If you missed it, you missed it. There's nothing you can do about it now. Obviously, if it's something you can reshoot, just take a quick glance. But for the most part, at an event, you're not going to be able to reshoot it. So just keep moving along. So what you want to do uh, is it also, just on a non-photography level, it takes you out of the moment. It just really takes you out of the world. You know, at concerts, you see like everybody's got their phones in the air and all that, and you're missing the show. There's this great show happening in front of you. So get your head out of that camera and make the picture. Use the, use the viewfinder for what it's there for. Check your exposure. If you want to check focus, fine. But don't look at every single picture. All right, a few more. Home stretch here. Eyes wide shut. How many people are, do we have any left-eyed photographers here? Left eyes, ooh, a couple, couple, all right. I'm actually surprised how many left eye people there are. Well, you don't have to listen to this because this doesn't help you, but for most of us, if you shoot out of your right eye, I recommend keeping your left eye open. While you shoot, keep your left eye open. Why is it? Well, the first reason is you can anticipate by just seeing some peripheral vision, maybe not sharp, but just some peripheral movement, you can anticipate what's gonna happen before it happens. If somebody's about to move into the frame or something else is coming, then you'll see that and you'll be able to anticipate that. If you're so tunnel vision that you only see through the lens, you're gonna miss a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, just, uh, it takes a little getting used to, but once you get used to doing that, also, just a funny thing you can do. I think also when you're shooting portraits, I think, you know, you need to move your eye away from the camera just a little bit to, to connect with your subject. If you're just so buried behind there, it's no good. Here's a little completely useless tip, but take your camera, and I don't know why, they, they've always called a 50 millimeter a normal lens because they say that's what your vision is, approximately. It's not, and I can prove it, because if you take a zoom lens, 
let's say like a 24 to 105 or even a 2470, and you look through your right eye through the lens and you leave your left eye open and you zoom, you'll see those two things start to converge. And once they get at the exact same point, it's 70 millimeters. This is on a full frame camera, 70 millimeters. I promise that every time that's exactly where it happens. And then it's a, just a trippy effect. You can just like drink some wine and look back and look through these things because your eyes sort of don't converge properly. It's a really weird effect, but it definitely proves 70 millimeters is where that is. So you can only do that by keeping that other eye open. Couple last things, uh, single shot action. I'm a big fan of motor drive, right? 16 frames a second, 20 frames per second. You're shooting sports action. You absolutely want to shoot bursts through all that action so that you can then choose the peak action, the dancer midair or the, you know, the, the musician with the perfect face, whatever it is. However, there are, so this is, you know, motor drive, right? We all know what that looks like. Motor drive coming through looks great, right? However, there are some things that lend itself better to single frames. So if you've got something happening where there's really a, some peak, oh, by the way, this is, this is more motor drive, right? So motor drive, what that allows you to do, it allows you to pick the one frame where everything's perfect, the facial expression, the, the, the water, everything's perfect. But there are some scenarios where even at 20 frames a second, it's not fast enough to capture the perfect moment. I'll give you an example. Tennis, if you want the ball right on the tennis racket, I promise you, even at 20 frames a second, it pretty much looks like this. This is 14 frames a second, and I'm not, I, you know, you might get it by accident, but that's not good enough. If you're shooting this and you need that picture, baseball, you want the ball right on the bat, what you have to do is really watch the person's motion and go to single frames and just hit that single frame, bink, right when they hit it. And that's gonna be the best opportunity to make a picture where the ball is right there. Even like a dancer at the top of their leap, you might want to go to single frames and just watch the move. You know, if it's something that can be repeated, watch the move and get him or her right at the top of that ocean. Obviously, if you're shooting strobes, you know, you may only get single frames. Um, and just to try to burst through that, you're never gonna get the perfect moment. So as much as I love the motor drive, there are moments, even with sports action, to go in and do that uh, single frames. All right, two more quick ones. They're, they're yelling at me over here. So on camera flash, there are times when you're using a speed light, right? And let's say you can't speed light somewhere in my bag here, my bag of tricks. You use the speed light and you're in a run and gun situation. You're walking with somebody, you know, backstage at a concert, right? And, and I just want to pop a little strobe in. Well, I may not be able to take this off camera and use some manual flash. So, <laughs> I know. Um, so what you want to do is you want to soften this light, right? If you shoot direct like this, it's really hard light. It's kind of nasty light on the camera. It's really kind of nasty. So a few things you can do. If you're next to a white wall, for example, you can turn this sucker. These things are all turnable. You can turn it and bounce off that white wall. And now the light that's coming in and hitting her looks like beautiful soft light from a softbox. It's this light on the camera, but I'm bouncing off that white wall. You can also bounce off the ceiling, right? These things have a little white card. You can put that little white card up. The white card, what that does, just kicks a little bit of light forward, a little kiss, not a lot. Most of it's gonna go up, but what that also does, sometimes I'll use my hand just to make it a little bigger, right? But what that does also, it gives a nice little catch light in the eyes. See that little glint, that little retzen, cling, that little glint in her eye? That gives somebody life. So if you put that little white card up, it'll give a little bit of light. Last one is about your hand. I just mentioned shooting my hand. What I do at the beginning of every shoot, I actually take a picture of my hand. <laughs> Why do I do that? Well, really what I'm doing is I want to check everything on the camera. I might have done a shoot yesterday where I had exposure compensation on and, you know, I had my, my aperture closed down a certain way and I was on manual and set whatever it was, and I had a whole bunch of different settings. I might have gone to manual focus. Well, if I just take a quick picture before my subject's there, before whatever I'm going to shoot, I take a quick picture of my hand. Why do I use my hand? Well, first of all, it's always with me. It's always attached to me. I don't have to worry about leaving it in my camera bag. I can see the exposure. If I'm using a flash, I can see the exposure on neutral skin tone. Of course, if you have different skin tone, you have to compensate for that. But in most cases, your, the palm of your hand is pretty natural skin tone. I can make sure the autofocus is working. I can flash my hand and see how the balance of the foreground to the background is if I'm trying to do that, and make sure my batteries are fresh and everything is working. So the hand is definitely a good way to go. There is one more use for the hand. If you guys take your hands and actually 
put them together. That was my last tip. I thank you so much. There you go. I did it. I was a little over, but I basically did 20 tips in 40-something minutes. So thanks very much. Listen, askdavidbergman.com. Go ahead and ask your questions on there. I've got that weekly show, so uh, we'll do all kinds of fun stuff on there. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.